Come on, how many of you love Pastor Cindy? Pastor Rick, don't you believe you have some of the greatest pastors in the world? Come on, let's thank God for them. And while we're applauding, don't we love Jesus? If you love Jesus, can you just give him a shout? Just Come on, if it's Palm Sunday, I think you could do a little bit better than that. No one like our Jesus. Nobody like our Jesus. Man, go on ahead and grab a seat. Thank you for the, for the warm welcome. Anybody else love Palm Sunday? I love Palm Sunday. It's one of my favorite, favorite days to recognize the gospel, to read how it is that our Savior came into this week. So it would have been his final week on earth. Uh, and then being crucified, celebrated, and then only a few days later, murdered. Hmm. If you have your Bibles, I want to draw your attention to the book of Matthew. Now, today being Palm Sunday, I want to read and preach to you the story of the triumphal entry. And if I'm being honest, I'm feeling kind of preachy, feeling kind of churchy. You know, I got my suit on, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but this story, it's the reason why we, why we celebrate this day. And I'm going to ask that if you're not taking notes, to please take notes. Uh, I think this is one of those words that will help you like it's helped me as a believer. I nerd out or geek out on the, on the facts and the story that help me understand how cohesive the Word of God is. And if you're like me, you may want to write this down. See, this moment, I'm going to read to you from Matthew's account. But this story is actually a part of all, all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And maybe that's not that shocking to you, but it's kind of cool when you think of not every story we read in the Gospels or in every account. But this one is. And it's cool from reading it from the four perspectives. But Matthew, it writes it this way, verse 1 through 11. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied in a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. I was reading that in the last service, and I thought to myself, man, that would make a good sermon right there. Loose them. I had to stop myself from thinking about it because I was preaching this sermon. <laughs> next time, next time. But it goes on to say, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord has need of them. And immediately, he'll send them. I just find it so funny because he just told two disciples to go to another town and untie a donkey, and if anyone looks at you like, why are you stealing those donkeys? Just tell them the Lord has need of it. <laughs> like, I don't know about you, but I'm from New York. I can't imagine Jesus telling me to do that, walking through Queens. Say, hey, man, what are you doing with my car? Oh, no, it's all good. The Lord has need of it, you know. <laughs> But it was, actually, it was actually that statement that caught my attention. The Lord has need of it. Why would you ask me to do that? That's beside the point. The Lord has need of them. And immediately, he'll send them. And this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus had commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. On this Palm Sunday, I want to preach to you from that thought. He has need of them. He has need of me. 
Go on ahead and write that down. He has need of me. And as you write that down, it's a prophetic declaration that you're going to just say over yourself. He has need of me. Because there's somebody in the room that thinks that God wants nothing to do with you. And I'm telling you, he has need of you. People in the room, you're in a season of your life, you feel like God has forgotten about you. That's not true. The Lord has need of you. There are some of you that are retired and you're trying to figure out next steps. And here's what I want you to know. The Lord has need of you. Some of you just figuring out college or, or high school. Maybe you feel too young, but you have a passion and a zeal. Be encouraged. The Lord has need of you. The Lord has need of me. Let's pray one more time. Holy Spirit, speak. Have your way in this place. And from the very onset, we thank you. We thank you for coming. We thank you for dying for us, taking our place on the cross, and then rising again. Thank you that you would include us in your story. And God, as we're praying, be with Pastor Rick as he travels. Bring him home to us safely. In the precious and matchless name of Jesus. Come on, if you agree, can you shout amen? Amen, amen, amen. amen. Thank you, sir. When the Holy Spirit began to move among the early church to record their experiences with Jesus Christ, he did not move one person to create the one definitive story of Jesus' life and ministry. Instead, four different people were divinely inspired to record important details about the Messiah. These four men were the Apostle Matthew, a young disciple named Mark, a Gentile partner of Paul's named Luke, and the apostle John. And each gospel focuses on different aspects of Jesus' personhood, but emphasize that he is Messiah, the Son of God, the rightful king. Understanding the relationship between the four gospels who wrote them and their unique themes only illuminate the truth of the gospel. So if you're taking notes, you should write this down. Matthew writes that Jesus is the king of the Jews. Mark writes that Jesus is the servant king. Luke writes that Jesus is the son of man. And John writes that Jesus is the son of God, the word made flesh who dwelt among us and the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. All of which remind us that he is worthy of our worship and our praise. Matthew points this out. Mark points this out. Luke points this out. And John points this out. So that we would never forget that King Jesus is due all praise, glory, and honor. We learn what Jesus did for creation, which results in us understanding why we were created. And I hope that piques your interest. To understand why you were created will shift how you live and why you do what you do. See, if you did not know, you were created by God for a purpose. And that purpose is to praise Jesus, serve Jesus, declare hallelujah to Jesus, ultimately worship Jesus. I'll say that again. You were created to praise Jesus, serve Jesus, declare hallelujah to Jesus, and ultimately worship Jesus. And if we're being honest, there is nothing like worshiping Jesus. There, there is nothing like worshiping Jesus. And that's what intrigues me so much about the story because as I read the story that I just read to you in Matthew 21, that's, that's exactly what's going on all throughout the story from beginning to end. And as I read it, I imagine myself on the sideline of that glorious procession declaring the praise to Jesus. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what that must have been like? Can you imagine what that must have been like in real time, in reality, to see Jesus riding on a donkey and being able to shout out with all the other people there, knowing that you are undeserving to be there, but you're allowed to be there, and you're able to offer up your worship. You're able to offer up your praise. Oh, what that would have been like to be included in that moment to be face to face with our Jesus in this historic and prophetic moment. And yet, as great as it would have been for me to be there, he did not need me to be there. In other words, he didn't need my worship that day in order for him to get the glory that he deserves. 
In fact, and I'm going to step on some toes here, God doesn't need any of our worship on any day in order for him to get the glory that is due his name. In other words, your worship is not a favor to God. Hear me. He wants my worship, but he doesn't need my worship. He wants your worship, but he does not need your worship. How humbling, how sobering. He does not need my worship, and yet he has need for my worship. That is a statement right there. He does not need my worship, but he has need of my worship. See, he doesn't need the worship that I possess, but he creates opportunity for the worship that I could give out. And here it is. This is, this is where we get to zone in on the why. See, this is highly beneficial for each and every one of us because the truth is, I know for me, I need to worship. I need to worship. Anybody else ever have that re revelation before? I need to worship. Because the fact of the matter is I've tried other outlets and they did not work for me. I tried complaining. I tried whining. I tried selfishness. I tried cursing. I tried quietness. I tried depression. I tried isolation. I tried self-sabotage. And none of that, none of that worked for me. The only thing that I found to work in life is worship. I need to worship. I need to worship in order for me to be who God has created created me to be. I need to worship so I can be the man that God has called me to be, so that you could be the woman that God has called you to be, so that you could be the parent that God has called you to be, so that you could be the child of God that he has created you to be. Me and you were created for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is to worship, which is why for me, if I find myself in a service as beautiful as this one, where the worship is as great as we just heard. I do not care the genre. I do not care the style. I do not care the tempo. I do not care whether I know the song or don't know the song. I don't care if the song gives me nostalgia or it's new and it's what the kids like. I do not care. If we are worshiping about Jesus, count me in. If I get the opportunity to participate in worshiping the King of kings and Lord of lords, I am going to sing it with all my heart. I don't care if I know the song by memory or I have to read it off the screen. If we are praising King Jesus, if we are given the opportunity to use our words, knowing that I have used my words for other things, knowing that he has seen me at my worst but does not treat me as my sins deserve, and he would still allow me in his presence to offer up my song, to offer up my words, accepting of my words and accepting of my my tone, self, my, my tone deaf self, and he would say, worship me with everything you got. I am pleased with it. If I get that opportunity, I don't care if you sing along or don't sing along. If we're talking about my Jesus, I'm going to sing with everything I got. If there's anybody in the room that would agree with that, give them a shout real quick. I am going to worship Jesus with every opportunity I get and with every moment that I got. Because both is very true for us as believers. We have to worship and we get to worship. As a believer, you have to worship and you get to worship. You, you don't have to, but if you want to keep going and growing, you need to. And what a beautiful opportunity. Because can I tell you? That worship is our opportunity to be a part of something bigger than us. Yeah. Worship is our opportunity to be a part of something bigger than us. And here's what's also true. It's just a fun thought. Every time I begin to sing a song and stop singing a song, that is neither the beginning or ending of the worship that Jesus is receiving. Track with me. It might be the beginning and ending for my worship, but it is not the end of God receiving his worship. God is continually receiving his worship. I once heard a brilliant theologian by the name of Daryl Johnson say this. In a worship service, the question is not, what did I get out of it? The question should be, did I enter in? I do not come to church to say, what did I get out of it? The opportunity is to enter in with worshiping the King of kings and Lord of lords. See, friends, worship does not begin with us, and worship does not end with us. And to enter into worship here on earth is to join in on a worship service that has already taken place in heaven. 
for eternity, both behind us and ahead of us, since forever and ever the angels and the elders are kneeling at the throne singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worship is a never-ending continuum that I get to be a part of. And there are several opportunities to enter into that continuum. If you're taking notes, write this down. I want you to imagine it this way. Glory is the atmosphere. Worship is the only response. Jesus is the only focus. And on this side of heaven, assignment is the vehicle. I'm going to say that again. Glory is the atmosphere. Worship is our only response. Jesus is the only focus. And on this side of heaven, on earth, assignment is the vehicle. On earth, your assignment is your vehicle to enter into worship. This is why here on earth, worship should not simply be reduced to just a song about God, because in actuality, true worship is your service to God. Which means my worship doesn't need to end just because I left the service. My worship can continue on as I live a life of service. This is good news, because you cannot live in church, but you can live in worship. You cannot live in a Sunday service, but you could live and worship. And if there was a thesis for my sermon, it would be this right here. Your assignment is your opportunity to worship. Your assignment is your opportunity to worship. God gives us daily assignments, and in return, we either give him worship or we don't. God gives us daily assignments, and we either give him worship or we don't. And it is with every assignment that he gives us that he expects worship in return. That is true then, and that is true now. It was true then, and it is true now. This is why when I read the text, I'm so captivated. I'm, I'm drawn to the worship, especially the worship that took place before the palm trees are being lifted and Hosanna is being sung. Look with me at Matthew chapter 21, verses 2 through 3. Look what it says. You can read it on the screen. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the son, blessed is the kingdom of the father of David that comes in the name of the Lord. It says, it says, saying to them, go into the village opposite you. Matthew 21, verses 2 to 3 says this, going into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them, bring them to me. And if anyone asks you, if, any, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. When I read this, I think to myself, how did the two disciples respond when Jesus assigned them with this seemingly boring and tiring task? Jesus says to two disciples, go get me a donkey. The truth is, we don't know which two disciples he asked. So we don't know their names, but we know their assignment, which is important because that's exactly how assignment is supposed to work. When I do for God, I don't need you to know who I am. I just need to complete what it is that he asked of me. And if, if God is going to receive glory as a result of the assignment being completed, that is not something for me to worry about or be conserved of. In fact, that should bless me and encourage me because here's what I know. He is jealous for his worship. So anyone that tries to get in the way of receiving praise that is due to God, you are interfering with something that you have no business standing in front of. Which speaks to the fall of man which is what makes fame so scary. Because no man or woman is deserving of praise or glory. All praise, all glory, all honor is due to the King of kings and Lord of lords. So he says to two disciples, even though there's 12, go get me a donkey. There's 12, but he only asked two. I don't know about you, but if I was one of those two, I might've been salty. You know what I mean? Like I might've been petty. Are you going to ask me? Okay, Jesus. What about Peter? He's crazy. Go ask him. You going to let Judas hang out? The one that's going to betray you? For real, Jesus? All right. You know what I mean? Like, we probably would have been annoyed. See, that's the thing about stories. We read them, and they read well, and they preach well. But can you imagine if you were in the moment? 
And that's the part that we have to get. That's the part that we have to get because the truth is this. God says to these two, go get me a donkey. And we think what an honor until you realize that you're being asked to get a donkey every day. You ever been asked to get a donkey? All right, let me say it this way. Has God ever asked you to do something that didn't seem to make sense? Oh, there we go. Okay. Or something that you didn't want to do? Come on, don't lie. That should have got a bigger response. So let's define donkey this way. A donkey is an assignment done as worship to Jesus. A donkey is simply an assignment done as worship to Jesus. So your donkey is your assignment. <laughs> I know that sounds funny. Your donkey is your assignment. Your donkey is your assignment, and how you go get it matters. I want to talk to you for a second about the attitude in which you complete the assignment that God has given you. Because you can complete an assignment, but when you complete the assignment with the wrong attitude, it's like the assignment wasn't even done. For man and for woman, it's about completing tasks. For God, he can complete the task better than you. So why would he ask you to do it? Because he does not necessarily receive praise by the task being completed. He receives praise by the attitude in which the task is being completed. This is why the Bible says in the New Testament, Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 through 24, whatever you do. You know what whatever means in Greek and Hebrew? Whatever. Corny pastor joke, I know, I know. <laughs> Whatever you do, work it, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. Whatever you do, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. Not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a, re as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. That is it right there. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So now let's go back to it. Whatever you do, let's fill in the blank on whatever. Loving your spouse, raising your children, taking care of your parents, how you treat your your neighbor, how you take care of your taxes, how you steward your tithes and offering, how you respond to frustration, whatever you do, understand that when you do it, it is the, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. So in other words, all of it matters in how you respond. On your best days and on your worst days, it matters. Because here's what I know about your, your best days or your worst days. Every day comes with a donkey. Every day comes with assignment. I don't care if it's a lazy day. I don't care if it's a holiday. Every day has an assignment because when you pay attention to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will speak to you and tell you what you should do and what you shouldn't do. It could be as simple as holding the door for somebody, but if you do it with an attitude or if you do it because you're in a rush, and I know no one down here is in a rush, but back home in New York, we're always in a rush. We just have pleasantries, but we don't even stick around to even see what they mean. You know what I mean? How you doing? We keep on walking. Why'd you ask? <laughs> Whatever you do, do it as if you're doing it for the Lord. So it is not about just completing or checking off a box on a checklist. Which let me encourage you, if you're reading your Bible in the morning and you're praying, I want you to challenge yourself that you get out of the mindset that if I just read a chapter, I'll be okay. Because the Holy Spirit could speak to you in just one verse, and you can't even get to the rest of the chapter. But because you're in tune with the Holy Spirit, you're allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to you, and you're allowing the Holy Spirit to show you what it is that he wants to say to you. But it is easy to think to yourself, well, I'm just going to read the chapter because then you know I completed the task. And if you just think that you need to complete the task, you miss the assignment. Whatever you do, do it with all your heart. This right here, by the way, will save your marriage. Husbands. Let's be very clear. When she asks you to get the cup of water, after you already asked her if she wanted anything, and she said no, and then you got in bed and you found the sweet spot. You know what I mean? That sweet spot. You lay down, and then she says, honey, I'm thirsty. And then you say, okay. It is the attitude in which you respond with that is either going to make that a pleasant night <laughs> or a frustrating night. Because men, we're so silly, we'll do it with an attitude, stomping like grown children, come back, give her the water, and then be upset that she has an attitude. 
We want her to throw herself, throw her, her, throw herself at our feet because we served her. But she's annoyed because she's been serving you all day and you couldn't just get her a glass of water. And you're thinking, well, I got you the glass of water. And she's saying it has nothing to do with you getting me the glass of water. It's the attitude in which you got me the glass of water. The fact of the matter is I'd rather drink my own saliva than taking water from you. It is the attitude in which you do what you do that all of this is hinged on. Worship is not reading the lyrics off of a song. Worship is allowing the lyrics of the song to hit your spirit like something sweet and being completely humbled by this King Jesus and going, oh my goodness, you would allow me to worship you. You would allow me to praise you, completely aware of who I am, my worst thoughts, my darkest days, and you still receive my worship. You don't treat me as my sins deserve. Oh my goodness, who am I? to hold back any worship or any assignment that you give me the fact that you still talk to me the fact that you would still speak to me the fact that you would still be present with me the fact that you don't leave me nor forsake me the fact that I'm in the valley of the shadow of death and I got myself here but you're still walking with me I am going to praise you and I'm not going to gripe and I'm not going to hold back I need somebody with that revelation to stand up on your feet open up your mouths and with everything you got give King Jesus your best shout. Go. We worship you, Jesus. What an honor. What, a, what an opportunity. What a beauty that you would be accepting of me. The fact that you would include me. You don't need to include me, but you do. Holy. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. If you would allow this, this dirty filter, this frustrated filter, this petty filter to still worship you, this, this immature person to still agree to operating an assignment, thank you for using me. And this, this my friends, is everything that God wants for us. Because the truth is, he does not need you to get the donkey. He could get the donkey better than you. But he is looking for a disciple that does not mind going and doing what he asks them to do, whether you understand it or not. Because you know what's so funny about the story? And I only just realized this when I was just reading it to you. And I had to tell myself again not to go there but to save it for later. And I'm so glad I remembered it right now as I'm talking to you. He says, if anyone asks you what do you need of it, say that the Lord has need of it. And then it says they'll release it. But we will get so stuck on what people will think that we won't even complete the assignment. So you won't even get to the other side of the obedience to see the blessing. You're living in your insecurity and you're thinking, oh, I'm going to look crazy if I call up that person. And, and offer them money or if I offer them a car ride or if I start that business they're going to say you out of all people are going to start that even though the Holy Spirit gave you instruction and said to you that I have need of it if anyone were to ask but guess what on the other side of it I'm going to release it but you don't even get the releasing of the blessing because you cannot release yourself from your insecurity you will miss out on assignment because you are too in your head and this is where I want to I wanna get after this idea. Your donkey is your doorway to blessing. Your donkey is your doorway to blessing. And I'm going to prove it to you through Scripture. But I want you to write this down first. I want, you to, I want you to write this down first. Assignment without humility is asinine. Assignment with humility assassinates pride. Assignment willfully completed announces praise. Come on, that's good preaching right there. If this was social media, that would tweet well. Assignment without humility is asinine. Assignment with humility assassinates pride. Assignment willfully completed announces praise. When God gives you the opportunity to, to take on an assignment, I want you to know he's not only setting himself up to receive praise, but he's setting you up to receive blessing. This is why, this is why it's so important to even pay attention where it is that Jesus is when he sends the disciples to go and tie the donkey. He's on the Mount of Olives. Does anyone remember why the Mount of Olives is so important? That is the same place where Jesus preached his first recorded sermon. 
His first recorded sermon, the Sermon of the Mount, the, the Beatitudes, it is right there. So now imagine this sermon that is all about humility. He's now giving us an illustration of humility. He starts and he ends with humility. He starts and he ends with the same sermon. When we get an introduction to his ministry, he's preaching on this mountain. As he's coming to the end of his time on earth, he's still preaching on this mountain. Man. If you were to read the text just in Matthew 5, if you could put that on the screen for me. Matthew 5, verses 1 through 5. Look what it says. It says, in seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. It says, then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and then look what it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Can we go back to blessed are the poor in spirit? Thank you. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Let me teach you something real quick. I remember reading this as a teenager and thinking that this meant Blessed are the poor people. Blessed are people that don't have money. Thank God that's not true. Some of you are like, are we allowed to laugh about that in church? Absolutely. God wants you to have money. Well, why? So that you could steward it properly and you could fund the kingdom. Because it is, it is finances that opens up opportunity for more people to be blessed. God does not want to give you money so that you could just keep it and be rich and buy things. He wants to bless you with money so you live with an open hand and you could help somebody that's in need. You could help somebody that needs to be blessed. And I want you to get this. I want you to get this because what this verse is saying will get you to, to the proper place of being blessed. But look what it says. Blessed are the poor in spirit. So do you know that the original word picture that when this verse was written down, the language actually gives us a picture of a beggar on the floor. Have you ever walked on the street and there was somebody begging for money on the street? You, you, you ever seen somebody like that? So the word picture is blessed are the poor in spirit. Somebody that is on the ground begging for the spirit of God. God, I need your spirit because I don't want mine. I want to be rid of my spirit. I need your spirit. Blessed is the one that admits that they don't need their own spirit. Blessed is the one that says empty me of my spirit so I can be poor of my spirit because I want to be rich in your spirit. Spirit. Holy Spirit, I want more of you. God, I want more of you. And as a result, as a result of begging, as a result of begging for the Spirit of God, you will be blessed. He is setting you up for blessing. And then look what it says. It says, blessed are those who mourn. Mourn? The Apostle Paul would later write, daily I die to myself. This is where he got it from. Blessed are those that mourn daily. They're dying to their own flesh. Blessed are those that say, not my will, Lord, thy will. Let your will be done in me and through me. I don't want to make it about me. I want to make it about you. I don't want to make it about anything other else. I want to make it about you. Oh, blessed are those that have no problem dying to themselves and living for Jesus. Here's a practical way of saying it. Every day you should be waking up to your own funeral. Now, that's a picture. Memorialize yourself. <laughs> Less of me, God. More of you. I'm dying to my selfish desires. I'm dying to my selfish wants. I want you. And as a result, you'll be blessed. And then look at the last one. The next one, it says, blessed. Put that up for me, please. Blessed are the meek, the humble. Those that aren't looking for much, that the meek. For theirs... For they shall inherit the earth. What? See, in the kingdom, in the kingdom, it's the opposite of what the world says. The world says, go after it. Go after it quick. Go after it fast. Take everything. Buy as much property as possible. And that's how you rule. You got you to dominate. Dominion, you know. God says, uh-uh, it doesn't work like that. If you just submit yourself to me and you humble yourself before me, you won't have to hustle. All you'll have to do is receive. Ooh, I'll just get it to you. I'll, I'll give it to you. Just, just operate at my pace. Just a few days ago, I was, uh, 
I was in Dallas, and I was going to preach at a church, and Al, who's my travel assistant, he's one of my best friends, he, he travels with me every week, but he wasn't able to make this trip because he had to work, so I'm by myself, and I'm driving trying to get to this church, and I was a bit lost, I'm not going to lie, I was, I was lost. And so I'm looking at the time, I had Waze on, and you know, it tells you the time of making it to the destination, and I hate being late, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like if you show up on time, you're late. And if you show up after the time you're supposed to be there, you know, don't even come, you know what I mean? Like, just, just go home, all right? But I can see on the time that I'm going to get there. So I just say, Lord, I'm going to preach, so, so it's going to be okay if I break the law right now and speed, you know, for your namesake. Just put a hedge of protection around me so that the police don't see me. You know what I mean? Those prayers don't work, by the way. We just, we tell ourselves things like that because we're idiots. Um, <laughs> that's funny. So I start driving, and I start driving a little bit faster than I shouldn't be. I'm confessing this, okay? Don't judge me. As I start to go faster, it's a true story. As I start to go faster... The time actually gets longer. I see it on the GPS. I was going 60, I start going 70. I see that instead of getting there at 615, I'm now getting there at 620. So I slow down. I kid you not. As I slow down, it went back to 615. So I sped up again. And it went back to 620. Then I slowed down again. And it went back to 615. Now, do I have any logical reason why that happened? I don't, okay? But I felt the Holy Spirit say to me in that moment, that's exactly how the kingdom of God works. If you try to hustle and make it there on your own, you'll miss it. In fact, if you try to make it there quicker, it's going to take longer. But if you just slow down and rest in me and allow me to guide you, you don't got to run anywhere. Which is what I love, by the way, because Jesus walked everywhere. He never ran. He was, he was never in a rush. He, he did what he needed to do, but it never seemed like he was trying to get ahead of anything. And this is what the Holy Spirit wanted me to say to you. I know the world is going to tell you to hustle and do the most, but God says, rest in me. Be kind be loving, be, be supportive. And where a world says, the world says, be about yourself, I'm telling you, think of others. Which is beautiful for the season we're going into because in a few days, we're going to have thousands of people on the property and we have the beautiful opportunity to love on them and encourage them and to be kind to these kids and to be kind to these adults and people that may never step into this building because maybe they're scared of church or maybe they think if they come in the building, the, the church will burn down. But we have the beautiful opportunity to love on them and show them the, the gospel in person. Do you know it was two miles from where Jesus was sending them to go? So think about it. Two miles. You want me to do what now? Untie a donkey? Let me just do the math real quick, Lord. You want me to walk all the way over there, steal a donkey, risk being arrested, walk back holding the donkey, because you don't want me to ride it, and then you're going to sit on it, and then I got to walk with you? So you have to do the two miles, but you don't even have to walk? You get to float? But I have to walk six? Huh? Doesn't make any sense. But yet to Jesus, it made all the sense. Because the fact is, like I said, he could have said, boom, donkey, and there'd be a donkey. But there was something about including the disciples that allowed the disciples to be a part of Jesus getting his praise. He does not need my worship, but he has need of my worship.
The fact that he includes me and uses me so that I could be a part of the story that allows him to receive the praise that he receives, there is something completely humbling about it. And I just imagine how many of us have complained about taking walks that we did not want to walk, doing things that he asked us to do that we did not want us to do. Like when he said, I want you to go apologize. You're like, I don't want to apologize or give them the money in your pocket. I don't want to give them the money in my pocket. I want you to offer them a ride home. God, they talk to much. I just wonder how many of us have argued with God about doing what it is that he's asking us to do. And, and, and this is why the Bible says, do not be wise in your own eyes because your own wisdom will tell you, Lord, there's a better option. And he's saying there probably is a better option. It's me. But that's not the option I'm going with. I'm not going with the better option. I'm going with my desired option. I desire to use you. So here it is. Go get me a donkey before you end up looking like one. That was Pastor Rick approved, by the way. I got approval to say that. I get the feeling that there are donkeys in your life that are waiting to be untied but should have already been picked up. And you keep procrastinating what it is that God is asking you to do simply because you do not want to or you don't see the reason for it. And to hold off getting the donkey is to stop God from getting his praise. Man. To hold off getting the donkey is to stop God from getting his praise. So let me say it this way. Stop delaying the donkey. I read this and it really got me. And I don't want you to quote me. I don't want an email. I'm not saying this is it, a matter of fact. But I did find this verse surprising. So I'm only submitting to you what comes from my own imagination. Fair? Save your email. Okay. Can you put that scripture up for me? Mark 11, 11. This is the same story in Mark's account. Look what it says. So after Jesus comes in riding on a donkey and receives Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, look what it says. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. He went into the town expecting to meet people. But it was later than he expected to show up. That's what the Bible said. What could have prolonged him or held him up from getting there at the time he wanted? Hold the emails. It is possible that maybe the two that went and got the donkey maybe took a little bit longer than they wanted to. Maybe they were just annoyed, complaining the whole time. I'm just saying maybe, not definitely, but maybe. Why are you asking us to go, man? I'm so stupid. I don't even want to do this thing, man. Doesn't even know who I am. I'm a big deal. He's going to ask me to do it? Oh, we do that in church all the time. Hey, can you go fold that chair? Fold that chair. You, you know who I am? Pastor Chris Durso. I don't fold the chair. People unfold chairs for me. <laughs> hey man, can you pass me that water bottle? What? You can ask the man of God? <laughs> yeah. There ain't nothing special. He's special. You get to be included. Go get me a donkey. Donkey. I read this story, and I think how beautiful, how beautiful it must have been as they're screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. We don't know if this is the same group that crucified him. This could be a completely different crowd. But it is possible that some of the people in this group were also the people in the same group on Good Friday. 
The same ones that were screaming Hosanna could be the ones saying, release Barabbas. They could have been. And we could say, how crazy, huh? How wrong are people until you realize you're not that different. You're not that far off because we will be in church and we'll worship and we'll say, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And then he says, okay, son, I want you to go open that door. Okay, daughter, I want you to give them a phone call and apologize. Okay, I want you to open up your home to them. Okay, I want you to give them that money. Okay, I want you to bless them. And you're like, what? Huh? Why? Now? You sure? Give $100? Can I do it in installments? 25 this week, 25 next year. Apologize. Do you know what he said to me? To delay the obedience is to prolong the praise. To delay the obedience is to prolong the praise. To delay the obedience is to prolong the praise. So what is the point of singing Hosanna if your life isn't singing Hosanna? What is the point of singing praise when your life doesn't sing praise? In other words, what's the point of showing up to church and lifting up your hands, but when he asks you to do something, you refuse to put your hand to it? He is looking for those that are willing to worship him in spirit and in truth, not just with their lips, but with their life. Whatever it is you want me to do, Lord, I want my life to sing Hosanna. I want my body to sing Hosanna. I want my marriage to sing Hosanna. I want my parenting to sing Hosanna. I want my finances to sing Hosanna. I want my business to sing Hosanna. I want to honor you. I want to praise you. I want to glorify you because even when it doesn't make sense, and that's the part, by the way, I want to help you with. So many of you think that that praise unto God comes in the form of something else and you miss it because you don't like the package it comes in. He uses donkeys, you're staring for stallions. You're looking for this big opportunity. He says it's not about a big opportunity, it's about the little opportunities of obedience and service. If you want your life to sing Hosanna, would you stand? If you want your marriage to sing Hosanna, would you stand? If you want your parenting, your family, your finances, your ministry, if you wanted to sing Hosanna, would you stand? And I want you to make this prayer. I want you to make this declaration. This is between you and God. Allow God, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you and challenge you and walk you through what it is that he wants you to do. Would you close your eyes and would you lift up your hands and would you make this song your prayer? time, just the voices, every voice. Father God, we stand in your presence right now. And we humble ourselves and we ask you to forgive us for procrastinating we ask you to forgive us for fighting we submit to your will and to your way whatever is the task whatever is the assignment whatever is the opportunity whatever is the challenge we submit to your way saying that your ways are greater than our ways and we say we want what it is that you have for us even now oh father God we are asking for more of your spirit and less of our spirit we want to die to ourselves and we want to receive you we want to be those that are meek those that are humble those that are honoring and we know that as a result 
result of that will we be blessed but God we say that you are enough you are the blessing you are the prize you are our savior and we are grateful for who you are thank you for going ahead thank you for dying for us thank you for dying as us thank you for taking our place you are king and you are Lord and we will no longer fight you on what it is that you are calling us to do our lives our our marriages our homes our families our businesses will all sing Hosanna summit if you agree with that and believe that can you give Jesus a loud standing ovation